two years ago. teenager in Ferguson, Missouri, setting off months of unrest that brought into full view the long-standing tensions between police departments and communities of color in the United States. We have had numerous discussions of unrest, unrest, where we have seen that that discussion or relationship between communities of color and our law enforcement. I was a mayor of a city for 14 years, and I had the expectation, and I enforced the accountability that my police force serve the community and protect them. And so that should be the expectation of every community. So today, I want to make sure that we have some open dialogue. I have so much respect for the people on the panel here. Just give you some statistics. Shooting deaths of law enforcement officers spiked 78% in the first half of 2016 compared to last year. And these include an alarming increase in ambush-style assaults like the one that killed eight officers in Texas and Louisiana. So we have some discussion and some enlightenment, and we want to look at some best practices. And we're going to have a period for you to ask questions, and hopefully we leave here better than when we walked in the door. I want to recognize uh, a person. I represent the city of Detroit. I'm so proud of it. And I just want to recognize a couple of elected officials who are in the room that have worked so hard to keep the community strong and make sure that our police departments are reflective of our communities. I want to recognize Brenda Jones, who is the president of the Detroit City Council. I want, to wrap it, I want to introduce Joe Ware, who is our County Commissioner for Wayne County. And I'll turn it back. Are there any other elected officials here? I don't want to intro. Okay. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Wooden. Pretty quick point, I'm going to give each of the panel guests an opportunity to take about one minute. That means about two ten by the time we finish. But please give some background about what you do, what do you do, what some of your challenges are in your community. We're going to start with uh, the uh, police department in Vallejo. And uh, there were some challenges prior to your uh, arrival uh, as police chief. Uh, in the last two years to 18 months, uh, the shooting is prior to your arrival were pretty high yeah. and none since your tenure. Give us some background, uh, your background, and how you have been able um, to have a zero number of police shootings under your tenure. Well, first of all, is this working? Sorry. Hold on there. Yes. Um, thank you for having me here today. And, and so the first thing I want to say is that I'm in no way here to take credit for anything. Um, but I'll tell you some of the things that we've been doing that we're pretty proud of. Just for some really quick context, because not many from California here, right? Mostly Michigan. So we have some California here? Oh, nice to see you. Mm -hmm. we, wish we should have done a shout out for California. California is here. Everyone in California. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do the District of Columbia and other cities as you move forward. Um, Vallejo was the first city in California to, to go back bankrupt and so um, sort of in the same poor timing as uh, that unfortunate result is um, Glow had a naval um, base a, a, a nuclear submarine base that was decommissioned that had about 30,000 jobs for a city of 130,000 not all of them were Glow residents but a, a great number were and so these two things happen at the same time and so you know in some ways I think Glow probably shares a lot with Detroit you know from that sort of financial perspective so a um, little bit of context we were, were about 125,000 people um, we were a police force of about 170 officers, which honestly isn't enough for 125,000 people. And two and a half years ago, because of bankruptcy, we were down to 77. Um, and so, to give you a little bit of context, really quickly, you know, because we get compared, because we're very close to Richmond, California. You're probably familiar with that city. Richmond's about 103,000 people, and currently they have 200 officers. So even now that we're not at 77, we're about 105. And we police a, a larger city with about half as many. So we have, you know, we are coming out of sort the financial hardship but it's you know kind of you can burn down Rome overnight and it's a decade to build back so we have a long road
road ahead of us, very optimistic about where we're going, um, but that's sort of the context of where we are now. I came into the police department, I'll be really quick here, about two years ago. Um, the year before I came in, we had seven police shootings for a very small town that ended, that resulted in the death, um, or with the death, and they accounted for about a quarter of the total homicides um, for the city, um, which per capita is very high. At the time, I want to say we were the fourth worst crime in California. Um, so it was a tough time. Um, we had lots of demonstrations going on, everything that you would uh, uh, expect. Um, also, that happened at the same time, a very popular police officer um, that was known for coaching girls basketball at a local high school, et cetera, et cetera, was killed in the line of duty. So you had you know, just a very complex situation happening. Um, and so, and I'll wrap this up now so it doesn't take too long, um, but what we did, and, and t uh, the man sitting to my left, Pastor Quick, um, we soon in my tenure got together with many other leaders and decided that, you know, we need to figure out how to work this out together so we can all improve. Um, and I'm sure some of what he has to say will, will demonstrate some of that so I don't take up too much time. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Uh, Reverend Quick. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, Chief Badu summed up much of what was going on. Uh, Forbes listed us as one of the top 10 most miserable cities in America to live. 70% uh, of our children are on free and reduced lunch. And so we're talking, as in most cities, high concentrations of generational poverty, unaddressed mental health issues. And of course, in our city, and in our county, in order to balance the budget, services that most readily dealt with African American communities were cut first. So there are three things that we did, and it says fellowship, I'm Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. Um, we took on our historic role. Now we all know that less than 20% of the churches participate in the civil rights movement. Every pastor who said they marched with King didn't meet King. Yeah. <laughs> Many churches that are more interested in self-preservation than community activity. But we also know that the only wholly owned and operated corporate economic institution in our community is still the church. And somehow in the last 20 years, we've begun to depend on other vehicles to get where only collective action can come from. Three quick things. Chief Badu and I met the first week of his tenure. Uh, following Ferguson, Vallejo is, to this date, as we know, still the largest Know Your Rights gathering in the country. Our model has gone to several cities around the country, New York, here in DC, Miami, Dallas, and we made a concentrated decision. We brought African-American assistant DAs, uh, John Barris, the uh, famous defense attorney. And we taught not only the rights that African Americans and young people have when they are pulled over, but we had a conversation about the responsibilities. Because we also have to hold ourselves accountable. How do you act when you get pulled over? How do you get home safely? And so we did that, and then we brought this man, the police chief, to the altar surrounded him by 170 young black bodies and prayed for them and him at the same time. Because in our community, you cannot separate the African American tradition from the African American spiritual tradition. We now host late night basketball. Every city does late night basketball. The difference is we could care less about the basketball. Last summer, we signed up more than 60 young people for health care. In one night, more than 45 young people found out their HIV AIDS status. Around the table, the police chief, the superintendent of education, the department of probation, the sheriff, the district attorney, all the fire chief, all the major resources, they meet, we meet in the church, and it's not about who gets credit or who's in charge. It's about how do we save lives and advance the community. So from that, we have created a couple of models that have become nationally recognized. I look forward to talking to you about some of that. The last thing I'll say is we recognize that not everybody can see the world through their own worldview and change it. 
So when we walk into the room, the police chief becomes the superintendent of education. She becomes the police chief. The district attorney becomes the pastor. And we try to figure out how we can do gap relief. So we never reinvent the wheel. If there's a service already happening, let it happen. Great. We want to find where services are. Great. Thank you so much, Pastor Quick. The Honorable Mayor from Kansas City, Mayor James. Well, thank you very much. First of all, let me say it's an honor to be here. I had the pleasure of meeting Pastor Quick in Vallejo. I was impressed then. I'm even more impressed now. Uh, in Kansas City, I need to set a little bit of historic context because the situation with regards to the structure of our police department is different than just about any place in the country. Uh, until a year and a half ago, there were two, the two largest, uh, the only two large cities in the country who actually had no real control over their police departments were St. Louis and Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, they were really uh, state, more state agencies than city agencies, and they were governed by appointees of the governor and the mayors of the cities both sit on the board of police commissioners. That's important because of how the police department then raised itself up in somewhat of an arrogant way because they did not have to be directly responsive to city government. That has changed. When I first got into office about 2011, had the opportunity as a member of the Board of Police Commissioners to select our new police chief, Daryl Forte. Daryl Forte is an African-American man who had been on the police department for about 20 years. Over the course of that time, he had kept meticulous notes about all the things that he would change if he ever became police chief. He is now in the process of going through that notebook and making those changes. As a Thank you. It's a very interesting city. Kansas City is 318 square miles. You can fit eight San Franciscos in it for you California folks. Um, it, it's about 472,000 people, a majority white by far, about 30% African American, about 15% more of other mixed minority groups. Uh, this is a city uh, with majority uh, a Caucasian population with a black mayor, black police chief, uh, black superintendent in the, um, uh, the major school district. So we've kind of gotten over some of our racial issues, but certainly not all. Our approach specifically has been geared towards kids quite a bit. We have a number of programs that we run. Uh, we had an incident on the plaza, one of our major shopping districts, where uh, African-American youth were congregating in large crowds, and by large, I mean hundreds at a time. And as they would run through the plaza and create a little disruption, uh, it was causing a problem. I was there on one night to see what was going on when a wall of kids came towards me on their way to a park to watch a fight. Three shots came, rang out in the crowd, three kids went down, and there was a stampede of kids. We then imposed a curfew in the entertainment areas, and as a result of, being, of telling them where they could not go, we decided we had to come up with places they could go. I'll be happy to get into some of those details later so that we can pass this mic on and others can give you a little hint of what they're doing. Great, Mayor. Thank you so much. I want to make sure that I give everyone the um, introduction that they uh, uh, deserve. Uh, Laura Coben waxman who is with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, that's the information that I have. Please give us your background to assure that we have your titles correct. Sure, I am the director, is this working? Yes. I'm the director of public safety for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I've worked for actually federal, state, and local government, but spent most of my career at the Conference of Mayors working on these issues. Thank you. It is an honor uh, to be here and to be with these fellow panelists. Um, the Conference of Mayors represents the mayors of all of the cities over 30,000 population. Congress, um, Congresswoman was a very active member of it in all the years that she was, was mayor, and we miss you, but it's good to see you. Um, and Mayor James is an active member. Um, we have worked very hard for decades on community policing issues starting in the 80s, bringing mayors and police chiefs together. In the 90s, we were very involved in the community policing provisions in the crime bill um, and um, establishing a cops office. Ever since then, we've worked closely with the cops office um, to help institute community policing in cities across the country. Um, 
when the events in Ferguson occurred a couple of years ago, we um, immediately started get bringing mayors and chiefs together to talk about what had happened and what needs to happen. We had a working group of mayors and police chiefs which developed, I have two publications in there out there. This is one on strengthening police community <coughs> relations, a series of recommendations. We presented it to the president's task force on, community, on uh, 21st century policing. Many of our recommendations were included in it since then. Since that report came out, we've been working closely with the task force and the cops office to encourage cities to implement um, the, the recommendations. More recently, after the tragic events that occurred in um, early July in Falcon Heights and Baton Rouge and Dallas, um, we started working with the White House and other organizations encouraging cities to have community conversations around race and policing and equity and justice. And uh, we know that a number, certainly well over 100 cities have, uh, have done this and those are just the ones we know about. The other publication I brought, and this is like a best practices publication, is description, contains descriptions of efforts underway in 49 cities and they're a mix of specific events that were held uh, in cities after the, the, er, the events in early July. Many of them involve the religious community where it's the city, the community, and, and pastors coming together uh, to talk about the issues and what needs to be done. Others are the ongoing efforts that police departments have had to reach out to the community and to, to strengthen trust. Uh, I will be happy to talk about this Great. further during the question session. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, he is the bishop at Fellowship Chapel and I think it would be okay as well to say the president of one of the biggest and the baddest uh, chapters uh, in the country of the uh, NAACP, uh, Reverend Wendell Anthony. this issue because it's very critical and I'm glad to see the President of Detroit City Council is here and I, I, I call their names because not only are they political leaders but they're not afraid to get into the street with the people uh, and to acknowledge the pain that often comes from what it calls this session to be. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to go back just a second just to let you know how I got here. Going back to stress in our community in the city of Detroit. Stress was an acronym for Stop the Robbers, Enjoy Safe Streets. That was an undercover police unit that made its mark in history by killing black people mm -hmm. and planting weapons and accusing them of making crimes. They were really uh, using them as guinea pigs and as holding them up and committing crimes and using that to say that we're, they're curing crimes. Stress, the big four. These are four big burly police officers who would drive around in either black or blue cars and they would make black people young people get off the streets. That's why we call them the big four. When you saw them coming, that you would move. Nihilus Green, uh, beat and killed by um, uh, Officers Butchin and Nevis, which is how uh, the current Wayne County prosecutor, Tim Worthy, rose to fame in the state and in the city of Detroit. Um, Ayanna Jones, uh, Floyd Gent, uh, Renisha Weems, and I can go on and on, uh, but whether it's Detroit or Kansas City or Vail, California, or New York, it doesn't matter. The same issues persist. Mm -hmm. And I have several recommendations, Frankie, that I would like to make as we go forward in this, because unless and until we read the documentation like this, until we read the Kerner Commission report, until we insist and mandate that police departments and officers and sergeants and lieutenants and captains and chiefs read the president's uh, task force report on 21st century policing, it doesn't mean anything. Recommendations don't mean nothing if you don't implement them or read them. And the problem that we have today is that not enough police departments around the country are reading, engaging, and adapting the knowledge that's already there. We know how to fix this. The question is, do we have the will and the determination to correct it? All right, Reverend Wendell Anthony. Mark Young, Vice President at Large, National Association of Police Organizations and Detroit Lieutenants and Sergeants Association. Mr. Young. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I would like to thank you too.
do, Congresswoman. You know I love you to death, and I appreciate what you did in the city of Southfield and what you're doing now. I had 29 and a half years in law enforcement. I am a product of Detroit, and I'm very proud of that. I love there, and I live there. Um, this law enforcement right now, this is serious. And America really better wake up. They truly better wake up. This is serious. Not all law enforcement officers are bad. They don't have bad intentions. They don't want to take anybody's life. They don't, trust me. There's repercussions on them when this happens. It's not just the prosecutor the being prosecuted. Most of the time their lives are destroyed. Trust me, I know. Been there. I've seen it up close and I know what it's like. You must support your law enforcement. I'm not talking about the bad ones. You know what a good cop does to a bad cop? We arrest them. That's what we do. You must support them. You must be the vocal majority to support them. You also must be the vocal majority when one does something wrong and hold them accountable. I'm really big on hiring screening. I'm big on that. I'm very big on training. As a product of Detroit that look like the people in Detroit, I'm very big on being tactical and practical. You can be on alert status, but I don't have to treat you any less than the human being that all people are. One of the things that I love to talk about is, I'm not the police for everybody. Don't get it twisted. I'm not. You know who I'm really the police for? I'm really the police for those who cannot fight for themselves. That's right. So, so, so let me break it down in simplest terms so nobody leaves here mis uh, misunderstood. A very wealthy person don't really need the police like you think. They don't. They got the technology, all, they got insurance, they got all kind of things. You know who I like to be the police for? Is the person that works hard every day, that, 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 that their dollar means everything to them. That's who I like to be the police for. So when you talk about bad cops, let me tell you something about this cop. Mentor over 300 kids out of his own pocket. Believe in faith to Jesus Christ, my Lord, Master, Savior, keeper of my soul. There's a lot like me. I'm a big person on hope. So here's something that you should know. Early in my career, I didn't believe in community policing because I was an I was aggressive cop. I was very aggressive. Locked everybody up that did wrong. One focus. So they taught us about community policing in the early 90s and I didn't understand it. Because all I do is lock up people. The broken window theory is real. My city of Detroit that went through a bankruptcy that almost killed me and my, the Lieutenant Rodney Sizemore sitting right here, who was my vice president of my union, the bankruptcy fighting for my people almost killed me. It did. Stroke, heart attack, all that stuff. Okay. Go ahead. What I'm gonna say to you is this. You gotta care about your law enforcement. You gotta support them. You gotta be there for them. Don't support the bad cops. We don't. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Of course, keep in mind, if you have a question, please raise your hand as we move quickly uh, through the discussion. Uh, don't be shy. I will start since we ended with your comment, and we wanna stay focused as well as it relates to uh, law enforcement and faith-based how the faith-based community can address this issue. But I'll start with you uh, to your comment, and, and you just ended, Mr. Young, that police, 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 particularly African-American police, policing the police um, in, in, in terms of how this issue are affecting African-American police officers when they too see these shootings. Some would say to you that they're more, more times than not, they're quiet on the issue. Uh, this is for you, Mr. Young. I, I, I My question was for you. I, I, would, I would tell you that um, misconduct in, in law enforcement is reported by their, our own law enforcement. Most of our complaints about misconduct, we, we police ourselves. And I'm, and I'm gonna share something with you about um, misconduct of people that we represent. My city is predominantly African American. Um, you know, they're, they're the people that pay our salaries. That's the way I take approach to it. And you know what? They deserve dignity. They deserve dignity. And, 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 and with that being said, I, I would ask the communities too to, to, to lessen the contact with law enforcement by parenting, 
by being a brother, by being a sister, by being a mentor. All those things help us. Mm -hmm. All right, great. And, and, and the relationship, you talked about, Mr. Young, community policing. Uh, churches are the fiber and the backbone of our communities. Uh, Reverend Anthony, you were gonna make a comment, and if you would, for each of the pastors as well, to address the issue. Some would say building higher walls and less relationship with the communities. Are the faith-based uh, institutions really connected to the communities that they serve, that police officers serve, to be able to have a voice? I, I would say in Detroit, they are, frankly. I think one of the things that, reasons that Detroit, in spite of all the issues that are in Detroit, has not gone by way of Ferguson or Baltimore uh, or uh, Baton Rouge or some other locations is because of relationships that we have between law enforcement and the community at large. We believe that you make friends before you meet them. In other words, you set a foundation so that you can communicate and talk with folks before uh, the issue begins to rise. And, and I, I appreciate what my dear brother has said. Uh, I certainly would not argue with him. We have some fine police officers. Uh, but it's the rascals uh, that are not fine uh, that we need to deal with. And we do not see enough police officers calling out and dealing with the officers who are the rotten apples in their department. That's the problem. One of the first recommendations that I made to uh, the Attorney General Loretta Lynch when she brought her Department of Justice team in, they're going on this national tour in regions talking to police departments and communities about how we can do what you're talking about today, Congresswoman, is that until the community can see police officers who are guilty of crimes, who are involved in excessive use of force, actually being prosecuted and going to jail and doing some time until the people can see that, then trust will never come between the police and the community at large. It cannot come. You cannot just hope and pray. We have mentoring programs, and that's going to resolve the issue. There needs to be, in terms of training, number one, training not just with law enforcement on law enforcement. There needs to be training that embraces and involves the people in the community, the local people who are the victims of the abuse of police tactics, they should be involved in training. Teach them the cultures and the mores and the folk ways of the people that you police. There should be mandatory use of uh, uh, Bible, I mean, of uh, breast right. cams and all of that stuff. That should be mandatory. There should be incentives. If you do not take the training, if you do not engage in diversity, then you lose your federal funds. There should be a deep incentive relative to police departments. There needs to be a national association of uh, prosecutorial investigative authority. When, the, when there's an airplane crash, the National Transportation and Safety Board sends in a team of people to find out what caused the crash, what can be done to prevent it. We cannot allow the local prosecutors and the police department to work together to be able to assess what went wrong in the police department. That does right. not work. There needs to be something that is triggered when that occurs so that there is somebody that comes in from the national level to do the investigation. Yes. And until you do that, there can be no trust. I love police officers. I believe what my brother is saying. But there are too many stinking rotten apples yes. that have gotten away yes. and that have not done time that is causing all the hell that we see in our communities today. Yes. And until we can deal with that, we're going to have a continuous problem. Reverend Wendell Anthony, let's take a question from the audience. We'll come back to the panel, and I'm glad to see so many hands. We'll mm -hmm. start with you, and if you would, would you please say your name? And you can just use your first name if you like. If you didn't tell people you were going to be here for the weekend and you're supposed to be at work. <laughs> and this is what we're going to do. You can just say here. your first name and the city and state you represent. Well, they know I'm here. I'm Reverend Dr. Sharon Patterson from Dallas, Texas. Good. I and if we could, just respectfully, if we could, if we keep our comments, because we have a second portion. Yes. So if we can keep the comments, and I love my pastors, I do. So if we can keep it within a minute 30 and give people an opportunity to respond, yes. and we have a second panel coming up. Go right ahead. Pastor. I am the daughter of a policeman, and so I grew up as a police daughter, so I have great love for policing. My dad was one of the first to integrate the forces in Charlotte, North Carolina. So he has a very nostalgic view of the community. The community back then embraced the police and loved them and gave them food, and they were the pride and joy. I want to ask the panel, can we ever get back to a time when the police 
these are the pride and joy of, of the community. They bring them in, they feed them, they're part of the family. Or am I just too far-fetched in trying to push that dream to stay alive? Great, and as we think about that, let's talk about the residency issue. In most communities, the residency issue was pushed by police and fire and the like. And it's hard to police a community that you don't live in or not connect, connected to. Right. So on the back end of her comment, if particularly the chief and the mayor would answer that question, we appreciate it. Chief? Um, sure. So in California, there's actually a law. If you're going to require somebody to live in that area, you need to subsidize. Am, am I on? I'm sorry. I was too far away. Um, you know, if you're going to have a residency uh, requirement, it's been challenged and that needs to be subsidized. And so what I would say for California, which is, is probably not unique around the country, but certainly in some spots, is it's a very expensive place to be. And so when people make and we try very hard to hire people that have a local connection. My personal belief is, you know, whether their wife's a teacher in the city or, you know, if you have some sort of connection, you know, you have, you know, it, it's just more positive. Um, but people make, you have very quality officers that make life choices that maybe live a little bit away from their PD because it's cheaper, they can afford it, and it allows maybe in, in this example, I'll give you their wife not to work so they can have a stay-at-home mom and don't have to do child care and they make personal decisions. And so it, it, it's not as simple as do you live there you know, if, you t if, if the economics were not in part of the picture, and like I said, California maybe is a lot different than other parts of the country, um, it, it's, it's just y you can't do it. But um, we should be very cautious in, you know, it was the comment that was made earlier. You know, the people often ask me, what's the big biggest decision you make? And there's two. There's promoting people and there's hiring people because those are kind of career-long decisions that affect the agency and the community. And so our conscientiousness in um, the rigor in which we select people for various reasons um, is more important than where they decide their address is. Great. Mayor, you are between law enforcement and the community and the faith-based community. If you could respond, Absolutely. and then we'll take this young lady's question. Happy to. Reverend Dr. Patterson, short answer to your question is yes. Um, the only thing that stops that from occurring is the fact that we don't do it. There's nothing that says that we can't do exactly what you say today. And I'm not giving short shrift to anything else that may need to be done, but there's no reason why we are unable to invite police into our homes, into our churches, into our schools, and we do that. Uh, we have a residency requirement in Kansas City. Uh, we are a city of 318 square miles. We have 15 school districts that are in whole or in part, so we can't say, I don't want to live there because the school district is bad because there's 15 of them. Uh, you, can have a, uh, you can have a loft downtown, uh, or you can be 20 minutes away and have 20 acres and a mule and a cow if you want. All sorts of living, all sorts of lifestyles, all sorts of price ranges. So none of those things really matter. Uh, there have been attempts by the police department to get rid of the residency required, and my response has been, not while I'm in office. I don't want you policing my city if you can't live there. If you don't want to live where you're policing, we'll find somebody else. Not only does the residency requirement apply to police, it applies to every city worker. Every city worker must live in Kansas City. All right, great. Um, question, your first name and the city you represent, and the city you're from. My name is Donna Scott, and I'm from Washington, D.C. And I know that many people are very passionate about this issue. And as a former New York prosecutor, I'm, I'm very passionate about this issue because I saw police officers uh, racially profiled, to me, a black ADA. And I knew that every year when I was issued the new penal law, the police officers did not get that penal law. I'm passionate about this issue as a product of the DC public schools where I saw when I was a kid, we had Officer Friendly come in and teach us about our relationship with the police officers. I am passionate about this as a current defense attorney here in Washington, DC, where I see 100% of my clients are of color and come in with little respect or regard for the system. So as we learn to build trust between the communities, what I found is we are approaching this issue from the middle. And, and we have to do that because we're addressing the issue currently, but the root of this problem, in my humble opinion, is at the beginning. So what I want to ask the panel is how do we protect future 
generations, the, the, the children who are gonna be the young black teens uh, tom of tomorrow, how do we protect them from this system when we, I feel like we've missed a step. We have to start at the beginning and, and, and not in the middle. It's great that we're marching, it's great that we're creating these programs now, but we need to train our police officers at the academy, we need to train our children at the school. So what programs, what is the vision to protect our future? Not starting in the middle where we are right now, and we need to do that, but we need to start at the okay. beginning. How sure. do we get to the beginning? Well, yes, I, I just wanna say that part of it is a larger philosophical question. And our community is far too often reactive than proactive. And, and I think we're always trying to catch up like Sisyphus pushing a ball up the hill. Uh, part of the, the, the overlying question is, what are your community priorities? And only the people that you allow to lead you determine those community priorities. Vallejo is not as big as Detroit, but when you have seven killings in a year by police, that speaks to a larger systemic problem. That problem has been resolved over 18 months, not one because we started from the beginning. We started bringing all agencies together. All agencies began to talk. We started focusing on prevention, not uh, res uh, preventing recidivism. We started looking at systemic issues. We have grandparents raising generations now on mixed incomes. How do you deal with that issue? I know Kansas City has, I was told, an, a whole complex with just grandparents and ch grandchildren are. So the, the, the last thing I wanna say is, is about what uh, Pastor Anthony said. Uh, he started saying about reading. And we all know reading is fundamental. The problem is we don't read. And we've got to be as intelligent in what we're doing as the system we're trying to confront. All right. and, and if we don't do that, we can't combat it. Thank you, Pastor, thank you so much for that. But why are we having this conversation as if this issue between the African-American community and the police just started as a result of Ferguson? This has been, and if you go back historically, there has always been a contentious relationship, and this is not new, starting in the middle. Reverend Anthony, you can respond in any of the panel guests, and then we take that question here, and then we come to this young lady it's, there. It's Reverend always, Anthony? It's always been there, Frankie, but the reason that it's being discussed now is because it's just right here. <laughs> this is, it's been brought to you live and in living yeah. color uh, each evening by cell phone. And one of the police departments, in some cases, worst nightmare is this right here because now it's putting right out front what's yeah. been happening over the past several years. And, and I think going to the question that the, the sister just asked, I think it starts in school. I think we have to teach it there. I think it has to do with residency in terms of people that look like you, that work in your community. There is not one answer. We have a program in Detroit that we started with the NACD. It's called Stops and Pops. We bring together police department, sheriff's department, the DEA, FBI, we have actual stops on the street with their cars, like how young people are confronted by police, crossing the lane, broken tail light, how you engage, how you make your home safe. We're teaching that. Now, I hate that. Why? Because it means that we are living beneath our privilege. We have to teach our children how to make it home safely. Other folks do not have to do that. But we want them to live to fight another day. And it is a very tearing experience to have your humanhood questioned and throttled on the street by people who have no connection to you. But yet, in order to make it home safe, you got to, in some cases, take that. We got to teach our children that. And to fight another day, it's got to be in the schools, it's got to be in the churches, it's got to be in residency, it's got to be in the policy. When you do something bad, your butt is gone. No cover up. We're not going to surround you. If you want the community not to, uh, uh, to snitch on folk who are doing crime in the community, you want the, we want the police department to snitch on police officers who are doing crime in the department. It's All a right. two-way street. Great. And Mr. Mayor, go right ahead. I, 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 and, I, and if you could, because he's been waiting patiently. I will, I, will, I will be as quick as I possibly can, but I want to take it back before school. It starts in the home. I'm sorry, it starts in the home. 
when we know that children raised in poverty hear 30 million words less than children raised in more affluent circumstances, that's in the home, and that's by the age of three. That's by the age of three. If we're waiting to do things in school, we've already lost the game. So, and we're not talking about hearing words like, no, shut up, sit down, get out of my face. We're talking about actually talking to children and treating them like human beings and, and not traumatizing them. A lot of what we have with our kids is they've been traumatized since birth, either by people who are supposed to be caring for them or the environments in which they live. We all have a responsibility to every single child. With regards to this whole issue of what happens beyond that, if our children are not reading proficiently by the time they finish third grade, and please make sure that they are, then they are going to struggle. Third grade reading is huge, but you can't be a good third grade reader if you're not kindergarten ready. And you can't be kindergarten ready if you're hearing 30 million words less. And you can't hear 30 million words less unless somebody in your home is not bothering to talk to you. Mr. Mr. Mayor, to that, learning to build trust between communities, color, and law enforcement. So if a kid that can't read by the time they have the third or fourth grade is more likely, you're suggesting, to become uh, a victim of violent crime as it relates to the police department because they live in an impoverished or a low income or are not reading proficiently. They also are more likely to be involved in crime. Okay. Not it just a victim, but to be perpetrators. Look, if we don't have kids that are being educated and who are able to sort through options and have options, then all sorts of things fall off the table. They become victims, they also become perpetrators. Now, There's yes, so Mr. Mayor, to the topic, then do you believe that perceptually when African Americans, more specifically African American young men, are pulled over by the police department because that's the perception and the numbers they hear, they're more likely to become a victim of violence as it relates to police officers shooting. Yes. So who's the perception? Is it, it, is it the responsibility or perception on the police officer or that child because they can't read? Well, well, that depends on the individual circumstances, to be quite honest. There is no cookie cutter right. approach to this. There really isn't. But do Sir, you believe, Mr. Mayor, go ahead. that the if the perception is that the average kid who lives in a low-income area, less likely to be able to read, being pulled over by a police officer, is more likely to be shot by a police officer because they live in a low-income area and can't read. Just put a scenario together for me. Well, I don't know if I'd say it's more likely simply because of that. I think there's a confluence of circumstances that lead to that. But okay. I do believe that there is racial profiling and racial profiling seems to indi uh, would indicate that there is a misperception of who you're dealing with. If you have an idea that a person is going to be committing certain acts because of their color, then you're going to react to them differently. And because you act, react to them differently, there may be a very different and violent result. But that is not everyone. And it's not always the circumstances. And it does not account, and it does not account for black on black violence. Frankie, Frankie, I gotta get in here. I mean, I, 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 I certainly believe in reading and I, I appreciate uh, the mayor and my reverend colleagues in terms of what they're saying because that to me is obvious. You gotta start sure. in the home. However, Sandra Bland was not killed because she couldn't read. No. Trayvon Martin was not killed because he couldn't read. No. Eric Garner was not killed because he didn't read. Trayvon Martin was not killed because he didn't pass no reading test. Right. I, I, uh, Ayanna That's Jones true. was not killed because she could not read. That has nothing to do with the issue at hand in terms of the level of violence that we see coming from police departments. And when it comes to black on black crime, I hear this all the time. It is a misnomer. Yeah. It's wrong. We ought to stop that. There's no such thing as black on black crime. Black people, white people, brown people, red people, yellow people commit crime in proximity to the community in which they live, according to the FBI. 83% of the crime of the homicides that white folk commit are against other white folk. 90% of the crime that black folk commit are against other black people because they live against each other. If, if they live next to each other. If you want integrated crime statistics, then integrate communities. There is no such thing as Korean on Korean crime, Jewish on Jewish crime, Asian on Asian crime, Italian on Italian crime. Why then are we always talking about black on black crime? That keeps us divided. That keeps us off point. That keeps us away from the real issue. Until white folk can talk about white on white crime, and there's a whole lot of that, then we 
so not, should not be talking about black on black. Crime is crime regardless of where it's committed. We'll take the question in the back, then I believe this question here, and then we'll go to the left. And I want to hear from some of the young people in the room as well. I'm sorry, we go to this question, and I thought, where's Harry? Harry's over there, and, and do we have two microphones? We want to move quickly, really, because we're just getting started. We need another microphone. This young man and then this young lady. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Harry Todd. I'm proud to say uh, Congressman, Congresswoman Lawrence is, uh, represents me in the, in the city of Rose Point. I have a 16-year-old son who looks like me. His job is to come home. Okay. There, like everybody who's sitting here, has, is sitting in the chair, has a foundation. The foundation of how to solve this is, this is a solvable issue. Crime is crime, is universal, as, as uh, one of the way just said. But the foundation is four, four legs. Education, outreach, knocking down, knocking down silos. And more importantly is the retraining on both ends. Knocking down that, three, that, that, that thin blue line of silence, as well as this no snitching policies or inherent policies that are, are exacerbated by many. We need to understand what we see, that broken window theory. These young babies are walking to school with seeing all this degradation and ugliness. We need to change that narrative so that they are able to walk to school with something in their stomach. That's right. It's hard to learn. If you're hungry, sure. it's I need you to cut it. But I have one. But I, I want to ask you a question as we wrap up, and then we take this young lady's question, and then this young lady. You live in one of the most wealthiest communities in the state of Michigan, Gross Point. Your son is more likely to get pulled over by a white officer than any other young man living even in the city of Detroit. So respond to what you said earlier, which was that his responsibility is to get home safe. You live in one of the safest communities in the region. Correct. Why would your perception be that your son's job is to get home safe when you move to the suburbs in one of the most wealthiest communities, but you're still concerned about your son getting home because safe? Because he's my son. See, the key is this. I can't control the actions of an officer. Okay. I can control him by training him. What did you train him to do? What did you tell your son? Shut up. up. <laughs> Shut up. Keep your hands, be visible. If you gotta say yes sir, no sir, whatever it takes. Now mind you, these are the same stories that I was taught years ago. These are the same stories that, that Brother Anthony learned going down south 50, 40, 50 years ago. You don't stop in Maryville, Indiana to get gas. You go get gas in certain other cities. So these are not new stories. But do you think you, that, that it's fair as an African-American man and no, now the second fair. generation, your son, not being able to stop at a gas station merely because he's African-American? You know Fairness is, 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 a, is a thing in the Disney movies and all that. It, I love to, to have the illusion of fairness. But in the reality is that my son's job is to get his ass home, and then if there's an issue, I will sick the dogs out okay. after the offending uh, entity. Now, okay. mind you, my fraternity has an Alpha Esquire program. Now, we take young men of color okay. across the state of Michigan, and we train them. I appreciate you, you so much, and thank you for letting me engage you with that. This young lady, I want to hear from some of the young people. Go right ahead. And then any of the other responses. And we're going to get to everyone. Please give me a time because we could go all day. Go right ahead, young lady. Hi. My name is Skyler. I'm from uh, Dallas, Texas. I'm a student at Howard University. And thank you, Congresswoman Lawrence, for inviting my social political uh, philosophy class to attend. Thank you for being I'm very here. grateful. Um, my question was about um, our rights versus respect because from reading the Baltimore and Ferguson reports, it seems like um, officers are taking us expressing our freedom of speech as um, resisting arrest, mm -hmm. as non-compliance. Mm -hmm. So how do we walk the line between uh, telling people their rights, allowing people to know what rights they have, and um, respecting officers? And how do we stop the arrogance mm -hmm. that comes with knowing you have power over others? Mm -hmm. Good. Because if yeah. I feel like I'm not held accountable to anybody, you say anything to me, and I'm going to do whatever Good. I want about it. Great question. So Chief, absolutely. what should a person, <laughs> specifically to this young lady's question, how should she then respond to an officer when pulled over? So let me just make this statement first. Is law enforcement is, is 
is diverse over our country as our cities are. And so, um, you know, I spent all my career in California. My first sort of exposure to other agencies was going to the FBI National Academy, and you have representatives from all over the country. And I remember, like, hearing people talk and, like, ooh, who does that? Who, who does that? And so there's a reason why, you know, law enforcement is under local control. And so what I would, I just wanted to make that point. Some of the things that you're playing out on TV and hearing is probably true in that area, but it doesn't mean it's true everywhere. So just please keep that in mind. And so and to answer your question, what I would say is I have two boys, 13 and 14, they're 20 months apart. And everything the, the gentleman in the back said, I tell my kids the same thing. You know, if you, if you, you heard about some of the history in Vallejo, and if you go back over the five years before I got there, because that's what I searched, and, and we surveyed all the, the fatalities that were, that were officer involved, um, the minority were people of color, believe it or not. And so this issue for us, right, so we're dealing with what's going on in Vallejo. These are, this is my community, this is what I have to, to face, and we're dealing with a police department that was, you know, solely, you know, resource restricted under man, you know, we were actually at the point of our low triaging 911 calls. Our dispatchers were trying to figure out who had the biggest emergency so we can send people and everybody else was waiting. And so when you have a police department that feels like, you know, I'm giving you a different perspective here and I hope you keep an open mind that they're kind of under siege. They're not, but that's sort of the feeling when you're running around like that. You know, they're answering calls and, and they're doing things alone that they should have backup, et cetera. And so the, here's this environment. And so when you look at our numbers, you know, it's very difficult to draw sort of that racial aspect out. But it's very obvious that, that use of force um, is relied upon uh, on sometimes when maybe it shouldn't be. And that's something that, that we're addressing. And so to, to answer your question, um, be respectful, and I expect our officers to be respectful. We actually do a thing, uh, a couple of different programs in town where we do mock uh, um, stops. And so um, one of the things that some are su of success with um, Pastor Quick is we have predominantly kids of color there for the vast majority. We do mock traffic stops, and, we, and, and one of my sergeants is here that runs it, and we critique um, what did the officer do wrong? How should the officer treat you? So that you know exactly that you should be treated with respect and, and then how to do something about it if you're not. But we also talk about when you're stopped, how do you act? And so I will tell you, the, the, the message that the gentleman back there said, you know, both my uh, boys are white, I tell them the same thing. And I think about my career, and I'll stop here really quickly. You know, when I was a kid, um, if one of my teachers called my parents, it was hell to pay. I know there's some of you out there in the, in the audience that feel the same way. And then as I evolved as an officer and we get called to schools and parents would come down and tell the teachers off. And so our society has changed and that relationship with police isn't so much dissimilar than it's happening in every public school almost across America. And so I, I just sort of add that to, to give some balance here is I, just what you heard, act respectfully, you're responsible for your own behavior, this is what I teach my kids, and if something happens differently, we'll deal with it after. The last thing I say, I promise I'll stop talking, is in our department, you know, we have citizens complaints and we have internal complaints. This last year, we had more internal complaints than citizen complaints. And what does that mean? That means that it's an agency that is policing itself in uh, to that degree anyway. So an internal complaint means it's employee saying something about another employee. And in most parts, to be honest with you, we have more sustained complaints in that realm um, because there's sort of local evidence to draw from. And so, like I said, th th what you're hearing on, on that happening in, in particular some of the larger cities is not the norm in every city. And so get involved where you are and find out what your situation is. Right. And your closing comment, because we're gonna have to wrap up and prepare for the second half. You've been so patient, we'll take your last question. And we're not finished, we may be able to roll your question into the next panel. But you've been patient on uh, this issue. Thank you so if much. You short and sweet, please. Sure, and my, we'll my name is comments. Royce, and I'm a 60-ish year old female. And I just wanna really tell you that I've lived in my community for over 50 years. I worked in corrections for over 25 years. My niece now is the assistant chief of the DC uh, Police Department. Another niece was a police for 17 years. And I have a cousin that's a police down in Sarasota, Florida. And I wanna tell you that I know the difficulties and the challenges that the police are having. But as a 60-ish year old woman in my neighborhood, I am afraid 
of the police. I'm afraid. I have no record. Please check me out. You know, I keep my home clean. It's just this feeling that comes, oh God, there's the police. Uh, 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 you know, what am I doing wrong? Did I turn that corner? Did I this, that, and the other? And it's not only the young people who are experiencing this fear. The fear is because I know none of the officers. And when they walk past me, it's not like I get the feeling of a respect of an older woman or a woman who's lived in that community. I cannot name you one officer by name that lives, that works in my community. And I've lived there over 50 years, raised my children and my grandchildren. So. Uh, What's going on? And we used to have, as this sister said from DC, Officer Friendly, they came into the school. We were, it was ingrained in us to uh, 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 revere the police, to love the police. At the age of nine nowadays, the children hate the police. They already know that it's like the police is out to get me. What can we do for a nine year old so that our kids are not hating the police? The police need to be groomed. Um, that police actually have hatred for the community that they're serving. And I, I know this from a fact, something has to be done. Uh, thank you for uh, what we're having here now. And this is a big problem. I cannot go to another funeral. All right, great, thank you so much for that. And just as a note from the uh, former district attorney, attorney here in the city of Washington, in the uh, District of Columbia, uh, as law for particularly because we have a number of Howard University students uh, and uh, the law in the District of Columbia is that if you resist in any fashion, even if the police action is illegal, if you know he is a cop, you are guilty of a crime, correct? Assault on the police officer. As we close, we'll start, uh, Chief, with you. If we, you would, your closing comments on this issue, Pastor, we'll come to you next. Uh, thank you so much. Please, a round of applause for Vallejo Police uh, Chief uh, Andrew Badu. And I'm sorry, did you want me to do a closing comment well, or address yeah. that? Okay. Well, I, I'm just going to say thank you to everybody. And again, I'm just going to reiterate really quickly what I said is, you know, get involved in your community. And, you know, what's happening, maybe even in the police department next door, doesn't necessarily represent what's happening. Um, you know, the more involvement you have, um, you know, local control is, is key. And that's my personal opinion. We in Vallejo, um, we've started actually, you know, several different boards. One's a chief advisory board that has defense attorneys, local defense attorneys on it, to DAs, to every part of our community. We actually, with that group, uh, did a strategic plan and then have implemented a lot that came from people that live in our community. Um, not only is it very diverse, it's gender diverse, but we also chose people from different neighborhoods so they're all represented. And so there's lots of grassroots way to make your home your home. And so I would encourage you to get involved. Great, thank you so much, Chief. Pastor of Friendship, Missionary Baptist Church, Vallejo, California, Reverend Dante Quick. Uh, I would say that the greatest danger to our society is living on the extremes. We laugh at Donald Trump because we think he's an idiot. We think he is ultra racist and we think this, and that may all be true. My concern is when we as a community live on the extremes. And when we don't want to be re honest about our own reality, not black on black crime, but honest about the realities in which the neighborhoods we live in. I get a lot of complaints from my senior citizens, not about police, <coughs> but about young black men in their community that they're afraid of. And we need to talk about that just as much as I talk to the chief about making sure that we have enough black police officers on our force. It's got to be a both and. It can't be an either or. And I believe that because I've got a 12-year-old. My mother's sitting here. I wore a suit on the plane because as a child, my mother told me when I was driving from Morehouse to Washington, D.C. home, It'd be harder for a police officer to kill you and hide your body if you dress well. <laughs> I got on this train, plane, I'm, I'm over 40 years old and I'm still living that principle. I teach my child, don't go and dress like somebody who is expendable. That's the psychology that we hate, but it's the psychology as my alpha brother said, 
You had particular books that told you which gas station you could and could not go through. It's not new. And the reason we're so stigmatized about Trayvon Martin is because we forgot Emmett Till. And we thought we got a black president. Racism's dead. Right? A lot of people did. And we went to Howard, and we went to Morehouse, and we left people behind. And we got to take responsibility for the kids that we couldn't send to Spelman. And we got to own them like we own our children. We suffer from middle class itis. And then we get upset that people aren't treating other people the way. We got to take off our suits. I stay up from 9 to 3 AM to play basketball and give social services. My kids go to private schools. But if I don't love the kid that don't go to private school equally and deal with the reality that it should not be right that I got to wear a suit, but it is what it is, and I can't live in a dreamland, until we get with that, we always going to live this cycle. Remember, Martin Luther King died asking, did I bring my people into a burning house? We got to ask, what are our community priorities, and be honest, not only about those who oppress, but be honest about our internal oppression. All right. Pastor, thank you so much. The Honorable Mayor of Kansas City, Mayor Slidey. Mayor? Um, you know, the one thing about all of this that I think is uh, uh, evident is that it's a multifactorial issue and we have to attack it on different levels. Uh, there is no doubt but that African American men uh, when confronted by the police have much, much, much more problems than Caucasian men. But it's also no doubt but that we need to change some of the basic underlying factors that lead to some of those problems that those young African American men have with the police officers. That's where government can and should step in. That's because only government can do things like allocate more money and more educational opportunities and try to reduce poverty and provide for more mental health and to try to eliminate some of the things that really do plague kids and families in this community. The other thing that we can do, and we can all do it, is simply start to reach out to somebody who's not like us and try and build some relationships. It doesn't always have to be somebody else's problem or somebody else's responsibility. There's nothing that stops me from talking to a police officer and trying to get to know them or them talking to me. And we have to be open to that. And as units and as organizations, we have to empower people to do that, and we have to do it. That's why we have PAL, where we have kids and cops playing together. That's why we have TNT, where we have teens in transition, where cops are the best buddies of kids who are on the verge. That's why we have KO, uh, kids and cops who are working together as mentors all the time. Because the only way that this is really going to change is when people who are different get to know each other and find out they're not different. And at its base level, that's the problem. We have got to change our relationships with people. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. She is with the Conference of Mayors, Laura Jacobin Waxman. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of really important and difficult issues came up today that need to be discussed further. Um, I would just mention, and this is something similar to the Chief said, there are a lot of efforts underway in cities right now to bring the police and the community together. And I would encourage you to get involved in those efforts in your cities. There are community meetings, there are citizens academies, there are all kinds of things going on to bridge um, the gap, to build trust, and to uh, begin to overcome um, some of the, the differences that occur, the other that have occurred. The other thing I would just mention, and maybe we can get into this more in the next panel, is we have to think about the police officers sometimes. They have really difficult jobs, yeah. and um, they have to deal with a whole host of societal problems with the responsibility of serving and protecting. And uh, they don't always do it right. There are plenty of bad <coughs> apples, but there are plenty of good police officers, and I think we need to remember this when we think about our own communities and we think about the profession. Great, Ms. Max, Ms. Waxman, um, to your materials, can you let people know 
those materials that you have and how they could access that information. Yeah, I put um, co a, a number of copies out there if they r run out, and please take them because I am not carrying them home. <laughs> um, they are available online on our website, usmayors.org, and there's a community policing page. You'll link to them and to a whole host of other things on Great. that page. Great, thank you so much for that. Mark Young, Vice President at Large, National Association of Police Organizations and Detroit Lieutenant and Sergeants Association. I won't leave you with fear. I will not leave you with fear. I did not come to be a law enforcement officer for you to fear me. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm proud of my city. I'm proud of the strides that we make in law enforcement. And guess what? We, meaning that side, have to do a better job. We, meaning this side, gotta do a damn better job. I hear you. I hear you. I am a product of the community. I'm very proud of my city. We had a protest here, and we didn't have to wear Kevlar. We didn't have to have it, riot helmets on. We didn't have to roll down the street with tanks. We're sympathetic. Most of us are more sympathetic than you know. We are concerned about a lot of things in society's problems. Chief David Brown of Dallas said it best. Society has seemed to dump every problem on law enforcement without giving them the proper funding, tools, resources, including dealing with our veterans and our mentally ill. Those are some of our most violent encounters. And guess what? To, when I encounter a veteran, I'm very tearfully saluteful. Some of them have problems and are mentally ill. What I'm going to say to you is we must do a better job. We must do it together. I hear the lady that's 60-ish that says that she fears the police. I offer an olive branch and a hand to you. You are the person that I want to protect most because you remind me of my mom. And that's how this law enforcement white officer right here looks at everybody that he encounters, as if they're my mom or my dad. We gotta do this together. Community policing is the key. Better training, funding, resources, and a hiring screening is the key. Community policing is the priority. This has to be a partnership. We can't survive without you, and you can't survive without us. All right, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Young, uh, Bishop Reverend Wendell Frank. Anthony. Thank you, Frank, and, and thanks to Congresswoman uh, Lawrence for the, for the session. I, I don't know why it is that when we have discussions like this in terms of police community relations, why it always gets back to, yeah, but what about what y'all doing to your state? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't understand that. I understand it, but I don't understand it. The theme of this forum is learning how to build trust between communities of color and law enforcement. That's what this panel was called to do, to address. And I think that's what we've been trying to address. When black people commit crime against black people and other people, they are arrested, <laughs> they go to court, and they go to jail. When, when white boys and girls are picked up on the street by the police, they go home. Black boys and girls go to jail. When police officers are involved in other situations that are excessive violence or abusive, they get a leave with pay and they get to go home for another day. Major difference here. If I go to the doctor to talk about my pain, I'm not coming to you, doctor, to talk about, to hear about your back pain last night. I'm not here to talk about how your feet hurt. I'm not here to talk about how you can't see if I'm checking my eyes. I'm talking to you about the pain that I have in my body. The Black Lives Matters movement emerged because people would not recognize our pain. There is a problem here. We are dying in the streets. Will y'all look at us? Will y'all see us? Black lives matter. We know all lives matter. That ain't the issue. But all lives don't matter equally. All lives are not being dealt with equally. Therefore, if you don't hear me or recognize me, I gotta bring it to you. So therefore, I need you to recognize my pain. And so when I hear all this other stuff, about things that do not matter relative to the incidences of black deaths on the street
streets of America and folk not dealing with that honestly and specifically when the President of the United States had put together a commission to address these concerns, when Ferguson and Baltimore has had study commissions to address these concerns, when this young lady has community conversations, Orlando speaks coffee with a cup, I was talking with police officers, mentor, we know all that stuff is good, but the fundamental issue is that police officers who do wrong need to be prosecuted and go to jail. That's the quickest way to build some respect and some cooperation. And to stop circling the blue wagon around police officers when they do wrong things. One of the things that should be done immediately is that when there are issues in the community, you should not wait. You should let the people know that you're on this, you're gonna do this, and you're not covering it up, and the, the perpetrators should be exposed. Residency should be held as a commitment in yeah. communities around this nation. Yeah. That should be required. Training should be involved, not only with law enforcement, but with people in the community who live there. Bring folk who live in the community to engage in your training. Financial disincentives should occur. If you are not following a diversity program, if you are not demilitarizing your police department, if you have so many officers who are involved in abusive tactics, then you should not get federal dollars to deal with your police department. And there should be an independent prosecutorial authority that when there is a killing or shooting in community, that independent agency comes in to do the investigation, yes. not to rely on local prosecutors oh. to do that investigation. <laughs> there should be mandatory, mandatory requirements of breast cams and everything else, not the kind that'll fall out when you're in a tussle, but the kind that will keep running no matter what the situation is involved in. Record keeping should be standardized. <laughs> Dallas should have the same obligations of report statistics as Detroit. Detroit should have the same obligation as Vallejo, California. Vallejo, California should have the same responsibility as New York City. In other words, you cannot <coughs> manipulate or tamper with statistics when it comes to reporting crimes by police officers in your local community. Until we standardize all of that yeah. and everybody plays by the same rules, then we just got renegade departments and renegade officers who are just renegading the people. We can fix this. We love police departments. We love police officers. We do want police officers to go home every day, but by golly, I want to go home too. Reverend Wendell Anthony, Pastor Fellowship Chapel, Andrew Badeau, Police Chief Alejo, uh, Police Department, uh, Dante Quick, Pastor Fellowship Friendship, Missionary Baptist Church, uh, Mayor uh, Sly James, Mayor of Kansas City, and also Mark Young, Vice President at Large, National Association of Police Organizations, and Detroit Police Lieutenants and Sergeants Association, and of course, in a very end, make sure that you get the materials out front, but we're not done. We thank you. Please give a round of applause to our panel, including Laura DeCoven Waxman, U.S. Conference of Mayors. So give us, please, just about 45 seconds as we make the transition with our panel guests. If we can have our next panel guests up, Colette Flanagan, Jeffrey Blackwell, Eric Rodriguez, Will Javondo, Tom Moore, Tom Ewan, and Jonathan Blanks and criminal justice. And in no order, but if you would, because I've not had the opportunity to meet everyone on our uh, panel. Um, so in no, no necessary order, and I'm gonna give you an opportunity after your introduction, if you would, if we could take a minute and a half uh, for your opening comments and we'll move forward from there. Please welcome to the panel, Colette Flanagan, Mothers Against Police Brutality. Thank you so much for joining us. Jeffrey Blackwell, the National Association of Black Law Enforcement and National Association of Blacks and Criminal Justice. 
Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Eric Rodriguez, National Council of La Raza. Right? How'd I do? I did great. Thank you very much. And also Will Jawando, right? Will Jawando, who is uh, with the Aspen Institute. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Kam Mua, right? I did good? Thank you very much. Uh, with the Asian Pacific American Advocates and Han Yuem. Han Yuem. Han Yuem, who is with Vera Institute of Justice. And also welcome Jonathan Blanks. Jonathan Blanks is with Cato Institute uh, Police Misconduct Project. So, Ms. Ferguson, Ms. Flanagan, we'll start with you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Colette Flanagan. I'm the founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality. I founded uh, Mothers Against Police Brutality in 2013 when my only son, Clinton Allen, was killed by a Dallas policeman. Clinton was only 25 years old. He was unarmed. He was shot seven times and once in the back. And the indifference that we found in trying to find out what happened to Clinton uh, was very difficult. We couldn't get help from churches, our politicians, or anyone. Being an ex-IBM executive, my mind went to work. And what we found out was no one was going to help us. No one cared. And there was a big blue line that was going to protect the police officer that killed Clinton. That shouldn't have never been a police officer. His behavior in the past dictated exactly what he did. He graduated from from beating to killing. So Mothers Against Police Brutality, we are now advocating for mothers and families around this nation that have lost children to police brutality. We are 100 mothers strong today. We are into policy and support of families. The part that you don't see is that most families can't even bury their children. Absolutely. There is no victim compensation when you are killed by a policeman. We've developed nine steps that are going nationwide and getting support of congressmen and congresswomen that details fair and just policing. We need special prosecutors. We need police officers to be drug tested. And we need victims' compensation. We need psychological evaluation. And so these nine steps are just nine steps that can help police departments. 18,000 police departments around the country all do different things. And so Mothers Against Police Brutality is advocating for these nine steps to be implemented, not only on a local level, but on a federal level. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome to our panel. Jeffrey Blackwell, National Association of Black Law Enforcement and the National Association of Blacks in Criminal Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was also the police chief in Cincinnati um, until just recently and the assistant police chief in Columbus, Ohio. And I want to say a few things first about the previous panel. I, I think we may have missed something that is very important. This police chief sat here and said when we talked about residency, and I don't want to talk about him if he's not in the room or I'll give him a chance to defend yeah, himself, he's not in the room. but it's okay. Because in the one breath, the pastor said that 70% of the young people in Vallejo are on free or reduced lunch. And in this breath, the chief said his officers can't afford to live in his city. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. We do have to have our officers live where they police. They cannot be afraid of the, the people that they are sworn to protect and serve. Hi, Kelly. So my model in Cincinnati was a little different. I believe in engagement over enforcement. I believe in lifting the community up, not locking them up. And so until we stop looking at a list in a book on community policing, we can't go through a checklist until we change our entire DNA of policing. We have got to stop having enforcement models, hiding in bushes, writing tickets looking for those little minuscule traffic things to pull people over, broken tail lights, one headlight, all of those things that we all know in this room lead to other things and to situations like this mother has experienced. We've got to start lifting our communities up. Let me just talk about one quick thing, and I'll get off because I know you're running 60 this. Seconds. 60 seconds. We talked about the third grade reading up here. In Cincinnati, we started a program where I had officers in schools full time 
not in between runs, not when they had a moment, but full-time every day tutoring and mentoring third graders. Why? Because if you don't pass the test in the third grade, you don't go to the fourth grade in Ohio. Kids that don't go to that fourth grade on time don't graduate. Those kids are in prison or poor or both. So I'm going to interrupt the cradle to prison pipeline by doing that now so that I deal with them when they're seven and not have to lock them up when they're 17. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Eric Rodriguez, the National Council of La Raza. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Where, he's going to adjust your mic. Go okay. ahead. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing my voice anyway. Uh, so thank you, I just want to say thank you for being here. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, NCLR, for those of you who don't know, is a 50-year-old civil rights organization on behalf of uh, Latinos. Uh, and we work on a whole range of issues, from criminal justice to immigration reform uh, and economic issues. Um, but very, very, very quickly, I, I just want to note a couple of things at the start. Um, uh, first, I'm, I'm from Red Hook, Brooklyn, uh, the great state of Red Hook, Brooklyn. Uh, so I know a little something about the complicated relationship between law enforcement and uh, communities of color and what that feels like. And I, I can tell you that in a lot of our work, both nationally and in working with our groups at the local level, um, there are very serious issues in the, in the Latino community with respect to law enforcement and their engagement with law enforcement. And it starts when they're kids um, and they're young. And many of the experiences that were shared earlier are experiences that I'm familiar with, with our community leaders are familiar with. Um, so, the, so even though the history may be different, what we want and what we feel is very similar. Uh, we want dignity and respect and to be treated like human beings by law enforcement. And we want to feel uh, uh, free of fear um, that something's happening in our community or something can happen in our communities. So I, I want to raise that first because a lot of the data is reflecting real concerns in our community that sometimes is overlooked. 20% of reported state and local law enforcement arrest-related deaths between 2003 and 2009 were Latino. 68% um, of Latinos reported concern that police will use excessive force against them. They're feeling it themselves. 70% um, of the U.S. population is Latino, but 22% of those incarcerated in federal and state prisons uh, are Latino. Um, and we know, we hear many, many stories. We do uh, community forums, groups, we, we do focus groups, we talk to young people ab about what they're feeling. And it's very, very similar to what we've heard all day long, which is um, the, the, the police officers that come from their communities um, young people feel like they're there and they're trying to do some good for them. They understand their lives a bit more, they connect with them a bit more. Um, but, but, the, but the ones that don't, um, the culture of excessive force is what they feel and what they talk about. They're profiled all the time. Um, and in the Latino community, there's just a, a one dimension that is unique, and that is the status, immigration status, and the role that immigration plays uh, in immigration enforcement. All of the things that we've talked about with respect to racial profiling guidelines and things that DOJ is doing, uh, they exempt immigration uh, enforcement agents from all of those things. So profiling is okay uh, if you're an immigration enforcement agent, even though it isn't uh, if you're in law enforcement. So these are very, very complicated issues, but they're issues that are important to our community as well, and I, I look forward to talking more about it. Great, thank, thank you. you so much for your comments. You can pass the mic to your left. Please welcome again to our panel, Will Jawanda. Hello? Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Congresswoman Lawrence, uh, for Thank the invitation. Uh, glad to be here, uh, and welcome to everyone. We're talking about building trust in communities. Um, you know, I'm relatively young. I'm 34, uh, African-American male. Uh, my, my entire life has been lived in two places. One, wanting to protect my community. I grew up in a low-income community in Silver Spring, Maryland, son of an immigrant. But two, also fearing police interactions. So it's kind of that both and. You know, I wanted police in one sense, but I didn't in another because I knew about interactions. And I would submit to you that if we're gonna start to rebuild uh, what is a broken system, uh, we're gonna have to do a couple things. We're gonna have to, one, and it was mentioned on the first panel in this terms of pain. We're gonna have to acknowledge the history of policing in this country. Um, there were two forms of policing going back hundreds of years. In the North, it was to stop drunkenness and it was kind of that old uh, English type of policing that is our, more of our current day model. And in the South, they were called slave patrols. And they were to round up people that looked like you and I uh, that had left. And we have to acknowledge that that is the history of 
our police force. And both of those have problems, by the way. Don't think the one is better than the other. Because the one, with the, when you responded to drunkenness and public uh, outcries, it was reactive. And you heard the chief talk about that. It was not, we're a part of the community and let's prevent crime. It was reactive to crime. The second obviously was wrong because you, you had slaves and you were chasing people and uh, killing them in many instances. So we have to acknowledge that and that is connected to the pain today. Two, you can't have trust without accountability. And there is not a real accountability system in many places around this country, whether it's a uh, special prosecutor, you cannot have the same DAs that are buddy-buddy and drink with police officers go out and then turn around and be expected in a fair and unbiased way to prosecute those individuals. Um, third, you have to have training that is meaningful, right? We're talking about, we all have biases, okay? We know when a police officer approaches a young African-American man from a, a, a recent uh, American Psychological Association study that they think that that young man is 4.9 years older than he actually is. So when the officer pulls up to Tamir Rice in Cleveland two years ago, he calls in and says 18 year old down after he shot him and Tamir's 12. So we have to acknowledge that those exist and work to counteract those biases. And that's why when we have training, we need to put more training in implicit bias, more training in de-escalation. Right now, those things are the minority in training. If you look, another study came out recently that showed that less than one quarter of training is dedicated to de-escalation uh, and implicit bias training. And I could tell you what is focused on, using firearms and self-defense. So you can't expect these officers to make split-second decisions when all that they're drummed in is how to defend themselves and how to shoot. Okay, so we have to reorient those systems. And so I think with those three things, understanding, acknowledging history, accountability, and training, we can start to roll back uh, the history and legacy and mistrust in many of our communities. Great, thank you so much. And, and in the interest of fairness and time, I'm gonna give our other three guests an opportunity for their opening comments and for some question and answers with the, the audience that we're gonna have to move quickly or because of time constraints. So um, uh, our next guest. Uh, I'll make this quick. Uh, so my name is Kam, and I'm with OCA, Asian Pacific American Advocates. We're a national Asian American and Pacific Islander civil rights organization here in DC, with chapters across the country, of course. Uh, you know, I think um, a lot of the things that folks have set up here resonate with the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. People all don't often realize that we're such a diverse community. We include East Asians, Southeast Asians, South Asian, and Pacific Islanders. That's over 50 ethnic groups and 100 different languages. The, the challenges that we face run the gamut from being seen as gangsters, people who don't talk, people who are deportable, and terrorists. And so for us, policing means rethinking the way that we think about race and ethnicity and diversity in the way that we, uh, in this country. And while we as an organization support movements like Black Lives Matter, we also know that we have to rethink the way that we talk about uh, how our uh, law enforcement has to police our communities and how they need to be trained. When we talk about implicit bias trainings, what, is the, what scenarios are included in those trainings? And then where are they in terms of cultural sensitivity? It's not okay for the police officers in New York City to beat an old Chinese American who's jaywalking because he can't speak English or to hold a gun up to a Hmong American's face in St. Paul because he cannot speak in the same language. So for us, it's about making sure that there's uh, that there is multilingual access in the way that we're talking about it. And a lot of this, despite the fact that we're talking about how we ought to start in the center, really starts with the law enforcement and the system that they're a part of. The onus is on them and they really need to understand where the communities that they're serving are coming from. The last thing that I want to say really yes. quickly as well is just, you know, for many of us, it's not just the school to prison pipeline, it's the school to prison to deportation pipeline. And so I want to end with that. All right, great. Thank you for your comments. And uh, Han. Oh, that was Han. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. uh, I'm Jonathan Lang. I'm from the Cato Institute just two blocks away. Uh, I work on a project on criminal justice. We cover drug or white collar crime. Um, my personal job is a managing editor of policemisconduct.net, and I think one of the things that we been, have been sort of like uh, overlooked in the last, in it, what people have said so far, is the role of policy. Now we've, we can talk about training and all this stuff is very important, but we have to talk about policy. If the police department is going to say our, our priority is going to stop drug interdiction, we're going to pull people over, you know, racial profiling is effectively legal because of the state of the law. So if the police policy does not change and says, 
oh, um, you are, because what the reason why I'm backing up a second, the reason why I say that, because people like racial profiling is against the rules. Yes. But under the uh, decision in Ren v. United States, so long as you got a broken taillight, you break any kind of traffic rule, they can pull you over. So you can pass every rule you want. You can have training for implicit bias, but so long as they're told they need to pull people over to look for drugs, that's what they're going to do. Right. And they're going to pick on the people that they believe that they can and get away with it. And Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let go to that, but if you want to learn more, I left a packet outside of uh, something I wrote. Great. We'll engage more on that as we're we'll moves forward. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Hayne Yoon. I'm the Governor Farish Director at the Vera Institute of Justice. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are a nonprofit, um, nonpartisan uh, research organization based in New York City. Uh, we basically use research and data to help to try to make justice systems more fair, safe, and more effective. Uh, we have a policing program at Vera that's done some work over the years in terms of trust specifically. Um, several other of our panelists mentioned the changing demographics of our country, and so a lot of our work is done in partnership with state, federal, and local governments, um, including police departments, and we help with resources, with training, with developing strategies and best practices. Um, we did a project on translating justice to help police departments deal with um, citizens who can, uh, and folks in their community who can't speak English and, and how to address some of those language barriers. We've also worked with police on how to investigate hate crimes um, and have a number of other similar types of projects. Now we're involved in two um, trust-based um, initiatives. One is ComSat 2.0, which is a collaboration with the Police Foundation and the Cox Office at the Justice Department. It's looking at, you know, ComSat is a, is a very data-driven um, enterprise designed for rapid response policing, but it's left out the, the community um, trust aspect. And so our hope is to develop, test, and implement a community policing system that police departments nationwide can adopt. Um, secondly, you know, we are very much um, uh, concerned with the issues of community trust that, that we've seen over these last couple of years, and we are, um, you know, investing a lot of resources into this issue. What we would like to do um, is find a measure of community trust um, and to work with different jurisdictions around the country to implement possible solutions. And so we welcome your jurisdictions if you have an interest in working with us. We want to test some of these solutions where community members and police departments are coming together um, to try to tackle some of these <coughs> issues. And I will say that uh, two issues that we've identified are first of all right size in the role of police. You know, we have police officers acting as school disciplinarians in our schools, acting as mental health counselors in the streets. But why are we asking police to take on these additional roles? They aren't trained for them. They, they aren't trained for those roles. They're not equipped to handle them. There's additional stress, obviously, for the police officers. So we need to look at what is the role of police in the 21st century. Um, additionally, we need to look at both internal and external ways of holding police accountable. Um, and lastly, uh, just on a personal note, as a public defender in Los Angeles um, for many years, and I can say that over the years I heard many similar reports of abuses, of illegal searches, uh, stops, seizures, um, and many times my clients did not want to challenge these practices. And I think that uh, you know the tragedy is that people face people of color face these types of uh, mistreatment, abuse. But also it's a tragedy when people are so resigned to this kind of treatment that they don't even stand up to try to challenge them. And so we're really excited for this dialogue. Um, we're excited for folks who want to find solutions and to address these problems. Great, thank you so much. And it's interesting to have this conversation because normally if you just rely on what we see in the media, you believe it is a black-white issue. Uh, and it is clear, Congresswoman, great job and to your staff on putting together a very diverse panel to talk about not only those of color, but those of color and those of color with language barriers. Because too often, uh, as an African American, you would believe that the, uh, what has uh, been called lately just the mistreatment or the, uh, the rift between the communities are only between that of the African American community, American community and police and their other communities uh, of color uh, that deal with these very issues. Now as we move forward and I'm go going to engage, please ask your questions. If in the event I did not get to your question and your question from the first panel and it could 
uh, relate to this panel, please feel free to carry it over. I think that this, the discussion is, is, is very much um, the same. I think you bring up a very interesting uh, conversation uh, when you talk about also policy and the policies when we look that uh, a lot of people who are now dealing with uh, some of the issues as it relates to police and identifying those that have mental illness, that our, our, our county jails and city jails are filled of people who have mental illness that should be in hospitals and not in jail cells, and how our police departments, and I, I would speak to our first guest, um, Mr. Blackwell? Yes. Mr. Blackwell, uh, with your law enforcement background, uh, to speak to uh, the kinds of training necessary when we talk about policies as well, when communities are closing uh, mental health facilities or the lack of mental health, but yet they're ending up in our county jails, and, and most of those people are people of color. Right. <coughs> That's a very good question. And, and so you, in, I'm pretty good at it. you are good. Thank you. <laughs> you are good. So in, in, that, in that context, what we have to understand is that there are more mentally ill people on the streets of our cities than ever before because of budget cuts and things like that. And police officers, the people that I have supervised and worked alongside with, have been called to deal with them on an increasing basis. In Columbus and in Cincinnati, both of those departments have crisis intervention teams. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to understand that officers do receive training to deal with them. The problem with policing in America, one of them among many, is that 85% of the police officers in this nation work for agencies with less than 35 police officers. And they get very little training, and a lot of it is not very progressive. And so when you talk about big cities, a lot of the big cities get the training. They just have to clean house. I used to say that policing needed a tune-up, but the engine is blown on policing in America, and we need to replace the entire engine. We need to replace how we go about what we do for people. We need to stop being guardian, or warriors and be guardians in our communities and lifting our communities up and helping people, not using those archaic traffic codes to pull people over and look for drugs and narcotics in the trunk and know that the people are afraid to do anything about it. And even if they do file a complaint, they know it's their word against the police officer and they're not going to win. You, you mentioned, and, and forgive me because I think we're out of order to a degree, um, but our panel guests have talked about policy. Um, and, and those policies, that these are not necessarily training issues, that they are policy issues that our communities are dealing with. And some of them are laws that are in place. I think in our first panel, we talked about uh, the body cams. In North Carolina, there's legislation right now where those, the, the, the tape from those body cams can't be viewed by anyone publicly, more specifically, even through freedom of information Absolutely. as it relates to the media. The whole idea to have those body cams were to be able to have a sense of transparency and disclosure to Absolutely. the community, but yet they pass a state law that says that information does not have to be made public. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I very much uh, endorse making body cameras more available, but the policies have to go along with it because in Los Angeles and other cities, they're saying uh, the police officer will be able to look at the footage after an officer is involved shooting before they make their first statement about what happened. So they get to say, all right, I already know all the evidence against me. I don't know anyone outside of law enforcement that gets all their evidence uh, th that's against them before they make their first statement. And so it's very important in the sake of transparency that we hold the, the governors accountable and the, um, and the city councils when they're writing these rules about the access to those rules. Yeah. Uh, about that footage. Great. And here's what I want to do too. As we move forward, uh, when we make our comments, let's let's make the comment about what we believe the issue to be and what we think a solution would be. Because I want to I want to have a cause and an effect. So when we talk about what some of the challenges are, make a recommendation, particularly from our panel, of what some of those things that we can do to deal with those issues. This young lady uh, has been uh, very patient, and then we'll go to your response. Then we'll oh. go to your response. Go right my ahead. Name, my name is Pamela Means. I'm uh, past president of the National Bar Association. I was actually president at the time that Mike Brown died. I've been practicing law for 20 years in St. Louis, Missouri. I work at the largest firm in St. Louis, Missouri. I live on a golf course. I have four children and one son. And you're wearing that St. John. <laughs> I'm just saying. My son is black <laughs> as the day, and I fear the fact that I live on a golf course that they may mistake him as a criminal on the golf course because they fear him not because he's big and husky, but just because he's black. Policy issue and the law is key. 
Congresswoman Lawrence, I would ask that you seriously become an advocate. And I want to know if any of you guys are familiar with the case, Tennessee versus Gardner. Absolutely. A U.S. Supreme Court case decided in 1985. Oh. We call what the police do abusive and abuse of force. Under the law, it is not. Right. That's right. If we are going to address the issue of policing, because there's a race component, mm -hmm. but there's a legal component too. The law in Tennessee versus Gardner says that a police officer has the right to use that measure of force that he believes is reasonable to stop the force he or she perceives. If you want to build trust in black community, eliminate phrases such as, I thought he had a gun, right. I thought he was dangerous, Here my life. I thought he was coming after me. They stem from Tennessee versus Gardner because cops understand that if they believed you were dangerous, they have a legal right mm -hmm. to shoot and kill you. Are any of you all advocating for the, the Congressional Black Caucus or Congress to change the law? States can't do it because it's federal law. All right, thank you so much. Sir. Let, let me start with you. If you could address her in response yeah, to her, I, I, then with, <coughs> with what you were going to say, well, and then we'll move forward. Yeah, I would just say a couple things. One is that the, the point you raise is an important one. Uh, and it goes back to the comment we just had, which is body worn cameras is not going to stop that from happening, right? That that I, I think for most of us who are civil rights organizations who watch what's going on, we agree that that's a positive step, but it isn't going to solve all of these problems. And and the leadership conference on civil rights and, and human rights and and many of us have principles because we're concerned just about that being viewed as a panacea um, to solving all of these problems. We know it's much much deeper than that. Many of the kids that we talk to and young people in communities about, bo even about body-worn cameras, they will tell you, hey, we're already surveilled, right? We're, people are watching this all the time. The thing is, is what is the culture of that police force, right? And, and, and cameras is not going to change that alone. Um, so I think those are very, very important issues and it's for us to think about, this is one of many things that have to happen in our communities. All right, great, we'll take your response and then a question here. So your, yes. Oh, oh, yeah, can I, me, okay, great. Uh, so thank you for raising that. I just got off a call. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland. I did a podcast. I'll send it out to Congresswoman Lawrence with the chief of police in Prince George's County, Maryland, which has a lot of golf courses and a lot of black folk and, uh, and very wealthy, uh, but also has very low income parts. And we talked about this issue of, sir, and I asked him directly, are you in favor of a changing the use of force and having a national standard use of force policy where you take the subjectiveness out of that analysis. Because how many of us have sat there, and I'm a lawyer as well, and watched the television and knew that even though the process, when Marilyn Mosby, my sister, brought those charges, if the standard is that you thought that I was gonna do something to you, whether it's reasonable or not, not objective standard, a subjective standard, more often than not, these officers are gonna get off, and you have to change that. Uh, otherwise, you're not gonna have real accountability. I started saying we need accountability, so I would, I would associate myself with your remarks and say we have to change that standard uh, and states are going to have to adopt it. You can do it at the federal level but in states, well what I'm saying Adam is you can have the guidelines at states where they can accept it and say I will accept that standard. They don't have to do it but they can. You've seen some states that are trying to do it. All right. Great. Question from the audience and then your response here right. and we'll Stay try and get to you I promise. Go right ahead. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Kelly Prather. I am a social justice and civil rights activist out of Cincinnati and I am a huge supporter of former Chief Jeffrey Blackwell. Um, Chief Blackwell, I just want to say that we loved you in Cincinnati and we know that you were actively engaged in fulfilling Loretta Lynch's mission of building healthy police community relationships. And um, my question I guess to, to you uh, Chief Blackwell is what can we do as a community to improve those relationships since I mean, it's obvious that police departments nationwide do not care about having those healthy relationships uh, with the community as evidenced by the continued uh, police brutality. And also, I was on the, um, I was a, a Bernie Sanders delegate and I was appointed to the Democratic National Convention's platform committee. Um, and one of the platform items was criminal justice reform. So I guess the second part of that question is, what can we do as a community to hold 
I guess, local law officials and local politicians accountable for that criminal justice reform that's promised um, on the Democratic National Platform. Okay, and just to sort of see the conversation. Thank you. Uh, you keep saying shorter and shorter. Right, I know, right? <laughs> Kelly, um, the first thing that I would suggest for all of you to take back, and especially Dallas, Dave Brown's leaving. I'll be putting in for that job, by the way. Um, oh, that's good to know. Listen. We've got to open up our playbook. Police chiefs and police commissioners throughout this nation don't want to include you in their boardrooms when they talk about what they're going to do. You have a right to know. You have, there's only about two or three percent of what we do in police departments that's like uber secret stuff. The rest of the stuff is, let, I had a meeting every month with Kelly and other community leaders once a month. It was called my external advisory committee, and I had an internal advisory committee meeting once a month, too. I wanted to know what my community was thinking, brought them in, let them know, here's what we're doing. We have to communicate and open up to one another, and then here's the risky part, and it's probably why I don't have a job. See, you have to change policing. You I'm have to ask you what happened. Okay. I'm, <laughs> well. I'm just saying. There's too many people filming live for me to say that, but <laughs> let me just say this. It's risky when you take people out of their squad cars and put them in schools. It's risky when I took officers out of squad cars when we should have been chasing bad guys and I was in the uh, uh, five uh, most crime riddled neighborhoods in Cincinnati every Friday night from 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the gyms, similar to the program they started. And by the way, James Craig stole all my stuff in Detroit. <laughs> but what we did, we, we called it H3 Cincy, Hoops, Heart, Hope. I'm going to tell you real quick, I put my money where my mouth is. The money we seize from drug dealers, I'm not the chief that buys helicopters, drones, and planes. I invested back in the youth of my city. And so what we did in Cincinnati, every Friday night at 6 o'clock, the kids had to be on time, 12 years to 18, boys and girls, 500 kids. We fed them a nutritious meal because they're hungry. My city in Cincinnati, and Kelly knows, we have one of the highest child poverty rates in the country. We fed these kids, and then we gave them a, a character, integrity, leadership workshop. We mentored these kids, right? Then we played basketball. But we didn't just roll out a ball. We bought them brand new tennis shoes, uniforms. We had referees. The media was there. We celebrated our youth. We did it for 10 weeks. Now, you can't measure love, right? And police chiefs are always pushed by metrics. We're pushed by data. You can't measure love. So what I did was I told my crime man, let's put a, a, a half mile geo fence around every rec center and tell me if we had any crime on Friday night involving a young person. And guess what? For 10 weeks, not one crime. And I'm talking about some neighborhoods in Cincinnati that always have crime. Why didn't we have crime? Because we raised the social efficacy of our entire city. Okay. We're going to allow the Congresswoman to make a few comments, but we're going to close in just a few minutes. But because of time, Congresswoman. I Sorry wish this conversation can continue, but we were only given a certain amount of time to be in this room. I want to thank everyone for coming here. I want to thank my staff. Would you please raise your hand for putting this on? Um, we have an amazing intern that helped us reach out to the students at Howard. And um, ladies and gentlemen, this is about all hands on deck. And so the first panel, you saw a different perspective. These are the advocates. Those, these are the people who are out. They're not police officers. They're out there fighting for the protection and the rights of human beings. I just want to give you a couple of closing points. Um, fair and just prosecution of police officers when they're engaged in what we know is unjust um, violence against citizens. Give police proper funding to do the job and training. I can tell you can't hold someone accountable if you don't train them. And I feel strongly that if you refuse to train, then we should hold back our federal dollars. I feel very strongly. If you're not going to invest in creating the accountability and the environment where all diverse groups are treated with that oath of office that police officers take to protect and to serve, then they should not get federal dollars. That's, you, you know, they say follow your money, you see what you value. Right. Right. Um, I was so angry when we stopped resident requirements in Michigan. And to hear that that is still happening in some countries, I do feel strongly. Those who live in the community are more vested in ensuring that the child next door, the family, and the community is stronger. Living beneath my privilege mm. really struck a 
forward. Because mm-hmm. I know when my son came home from college and he and his boys wanted to go to downtown Detroit and just hang out and have fun. College young men. I couldn't sleep that night because it was four of them in a car. And I said, oh, please, don't, you know, make sure you have a designated drive. Don't speed. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm all concerned texting, saying, are you guys mm-hmm. okay? Good don't talk. forget. Conduct Good yourself talk. the right way. <laughs> That's living beneath my privilege as an American. That, that is not right, and we have to address that issue. I want to say thank you all so much. This conversation continues. I want to thank the diverse perspective that we bring on this. Because if anything else, and I'm going to be partisan right now, if Donald Trump has not showed us anything, is that diversity in America today Don't think because you're not Hispanic that you're not on the list. Don't think because you're African American you're not on the list. And the young people, this next generation has taught us, because Black Black Lives Matter is being driven by all diverse groups. And it's, it's people stepping up saying it's not right in America. And so thank you all so much because of the America that I love and I want to live in for my children and for the next generation is one where they are not afraid of the people who are supposed to protect them. So I want to thank you so much. Before I give the mic back, I just want to thank Frankie Garcelle, who is a woman that I have listened to for years. She's a radio personality, but she's also a voice of conscience in our community, where she forces us to confront issues that affect us day to day. So I just want to thank you you amazing woman, and thank you for all that you've done for the community. And Congresswoman, thank you so much for this invitation. This has been amazing. I love doing this, and I love hearing these conversations. And what we realize is that no matter where your community is in this country, we're more alike than dislike. And if we spend more time talking to each other instead of at each other, we'll find out we have more in common than we have in difference. And the key is to be able to network our communities together so that collectively we can make change. Uh, so whether you're in Ferguson or whether you're in, in, in Miami or Detroit or Cincinnati and the like. I must know, with great respect to those who took time out, uh, Congresswoman, we recognize that you have to leave, but we want to be able to give each of you, if you can, 60 seconds, 62 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> to be able to make your closing comments and to the your time with us today. We'll start at the end of our, our panel. I just want to thank everyone for this really great discussion. And I also, again, want to invite anyone from a jurisdiction where police and community members are willing to take a risk, come together, pilot a solution, and test it. Vera is interested in working with you, and I'll be around afterwards if you want to talk to me. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank the Congresswoman for uh, inviting me and uh, to recommend a piece I wrote on uh, pretextual stops, uh, also known as driving while black. Uh, outside is called uh, Thin Blue Lies. And uh, if you have any questions about police misconduct, uh, my contact information is along with all those packets, and let me let us know at Cato. Thank you. I uh, just want to thank the Congresswoman as well for inviting us to speak. Um, I lead with uh, a comment that we have to rethink the way that we do law enforcement in our country and rethink the way that race is part of that conversation. Mm-hmm. We need to understand that our country is changing and diversifying, and we have to accommodate the communities that are emerging, whether it's 10 people or 100 people or 100,000 people. The other thing that I also want to say is that it's important for us to look at communities uh, and and law enforcement in an intersectional way and for us to also think about how we untangle immigration from the uh, law enforcement system. Criminal justice is not just about criminal justice and it's not just about uh, looking at body cameras for police officers, but it's also about making sure that, uh, that law enforcement officers are not the vehicle for immigration and for deportation of uh, Somalian Americans, for Hmong Americans, for Khmer Americans, and other folks who are living in the country. So I, I, I want to echo that uh, very quickly. I mean, we had, um, uh, there's great things going on in communities and great community leaders all across the country who are doing fabulous things with police departments. Uh, we, had a, we had a community leader in the Valley in California who had families walk into her office and say, look, I, we have some trouble. We have um, police that are stopping people and they're just taking them away off the streets um, and they're not coming back. And part of it was because of uh, agreements around immigration reform, immigration enforcement. Um, So she organized. 
She got the community together. She went down to the police department. She talked to them, uh, and they resolved the matter. They fixed it. People are doing great and fabulous things across the country, and they're being empowered. Um, and we've got to do more to lift up those examples and bring them to faith. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congresswoman, again, and to my panelists. Uh, I will just say that everyone in the room needs to realize, and I want to make it actionable, that you have a role to play in this reform and these trust and these relationships. Do you know, and ask yourself this question, you don't have to raise your hand, if your local police jurisdiction has a community accountability board and if it has an investigative authority? If you don't know the answer to that question, you should, and you should try to get on it or know someone and talk to someone who's on it. There are real things you can do in your local community to have an impact. Uh, and I also want to echo the point on race. Uh, and, and if you do that, you will respect the diversity of the issues. If it's an immigration, primarily in the Hmong community up in Milwaukee, or if it's a, in Detroit and African Americans, if you're involved locally, you will, by that nature, get involved in the issues based on race. But we also have to understand that 50% of black men in this country are arrested by the time they're 23, 44% of Latino men, uh, one in three African American men will serve time in jail, we have to understand we have too many laws on the books. They're not applied equally. Uh, and so we have to get involved at the policy level, but we have to also get involved locally. So I appreciate everyone coming out, and I appreciate the time. And a different level of accountability, and this is a conversation for the lawyers in the room, even as it relates to judges who use or stretch on their authority. That's right. Thank you, Congressman, I'm just saying. Uh, Congresswoman Lawrence. Thank you so much for having the courage to do this. Your commitment is so important. Absolutely. We have to understand that we are in peril. We are not dealing with a few bad apples. We are past bushels. We are into orchards of bad apples. There is a culture in the police department that allows policemen to behave the way that they do. Our sons are being killed. Our daughters are being killed unjustly. It doesn't matter how we dress them. It doesn't matter what we tell them, what to say. My son, too, lived on a golf course, and he was killed. It doesn't matter. We have to get away from talking about and putting all the blame on our children. They are not the experts. They are the children. So we need to take the responsibility and understand, like in Dallas, Dallas is the model police force. I live in Dallas, and yet Dallas has not indicted one police officer for killing an, an unarmed, a mentally ill person in 43 years. Last time Dallas in, in, indicted a police officer, Richard Nixon was president. Now you think about that. But yet, Dallas is the model police force. That is what we're modeling our other police forces behind. So we need to understand what is going on in our communities. And we have to get involved. This problem is not going to fix itself. We have to petition the DOJ. The DOJ needs to lower the bar. The bar is too high. And so we have to stay involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chief? Thank you. 60, Thank you. One second. 63, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Congresswoman, for inviting me. First, let me just say this. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I work with some of the most honorable human beings on the planet who are police officers. Really, black and white. They go out every single day. They love the community that they work with, and they do a great job. The problem is, is that they remain silent right. when their buddies do wrong. That's right. And that's the problem. And you can't be honorable when you want to. You have to be honorable all the time. Yeah. The second thing is this, and this is what I tell young officers when I used to go to the academy as the chief and talk to them. Real quick, when you see a young black or brown boy that gives you shade and attitude and acts disrespectful, don't take it personal. It's not personal, it's generational. He's reacting to what his father told him and what his grandfather told his father and so forth. He mistrusts you. He's afraid of you. You're the paid professional. You work that out with him right. without going to force and threats of force and guns and tasers and mace. Stop being afraid. If you're afraid to be a police officer, get another job. Great. To all of our panel, please give our panel guests a great big round of applause. To our host, the Honorable Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. And give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for your time.